Hey, thank you so much, Cecilia, and welcome everybody in our audience to today's webcast, Show Me the Storage, a technical deep dive on hardwareless SAN technologies for remote office situations, sponsored by Starwind. I'm Chris Flack with Redmond Magazine, and I'm going to be here just to briefly open today's webcast and get everything settled with the groundwork for today. So thank you all for joining us for part two of a little two-part series of this webcast. And if you joined us the other day uh, on Tuesday for part one, thank you very much. Uh, now, just a couple of quick things before we get started with today's presentation. Uh, we will have a Q&A at the end of today's webcast. However, we do encourage you at any point during today's presentation to enter your question via the Ask a Question box appearing on the left-hand side of your console. And hopefully, if time permits, we'll get to everybody's questions and uh, get out some answers. But please do feel free to submit your questions at any time as our host is known to grab your questions on the go. Um, also, today's webcast is being recorded and archived for future viewing and listening purposes, and we'll send you a link to the email you registered with within 24 to 48 hours after today's webcast. So keep an eye out on that link for, in the email for coworkers and colleagues and friends who may be interested as well. Please share that with them, and we'd appreciate that. Uh, joining us for today's webcast, we have a really great presenter joining us from Starwind. Uh, his name is Max Kolomaitsev. He is a product manager for Starwind Software. He's got numerous years of experience in the field, but I think most of all today what's going to be most interesting is he's going to be deeping a little bit uh, d uh, deeper, diving a little bit deeper into uh, what Starwind has to offer with a little bit of a product demo in the second portion of today's webcast. So please keep your eye out for that. Uh, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, but joining us and your host for today's webcast uh, is Greg Shields. Uh, Greg is an independent author and speaker and IT consultant as well as a partner and principal technologist with Concentrated Technology uh, with 15 years in information technology. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Greg is contributing editor and columnist for TechNet Magazine and Redmond Magazine as well as a former columnist for Virtualization Review Magazine. He has authored or contributed to 11 books and countless white papers and webcasts just like this one. Uh, Greg is a highly sought after and top ranked speaker for both live and recorded events and is seen regularly at conferences like Tech Mentor events, Microsoft Tech Ed, VMworld, and the Microsoft Management Summit. Uh, and with that, I'd like to hand over thing to Greg so he can get started with the presentation and get to the, today's conversation started with uh, Max. So, Greg, why don't you take the floor? Chris, thank you. Thanks also to all of you for taking some time out of your day. <clears throat> well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. It is time for part two of this lovely little two-part series that uh, the guys over at Starwind Software have agreed to do for us. And uh, being part two of this two-part series, you know, I think a lot of people back on that part one got an opportunity to see some of the, the business benefits of why you might consider implementing a harborless SAN solution in your remote offices and branch offices. But uh, I think a lot of people kind of left that last webinar wondering, well, you know what, show me the storage. Show me actually what it is that uh, I'm actually intending on or, or desiring to implement if I want to use the solutions that follow that kind of hardwareless approach. And so that, it is for that reason that we put together this part two here as more of a technical deep dive on the actual kind of magic that goes on when you implement a hardwareless SAM. So congratulations, welcome, welcome as is, all of us have said here to part two. And if you haven't had an opportunity yet, uh, I believe the part one of this two-part series should be available for, for download and uh, to actually review when you get done with this one. So happy to see you once again and welcome. Now, just a little bit of review, just one or two seconds here of review about what we talked about back on that last part. And that has to do with the fact that when you're dealing with remote offices, when you're dealing with branch offices, you're really dealing with special situations. Those of us that have, that have the privilege of working in single site organizations kind of have it easy as it relates to storage because, well, when I have a storage in a single location, I only have to worry about extending it out to the people on that local area network. But for those of us that unfortunately have to deal with some of these remote offices, well, things get much more challenging because of a variety of different conflicting requirements that happen in the remote office situation. First and foremost, a remote office is kind of by definition not the main office. And because of that, the remote office is probably going to be a smaller number of people, probably going to be one of many different remote offices, probably doesn't have the fastest network connection plugged into it, in almost every case not a LAN-type connection something that can be managed in your local office, preventing you from having to drive around and manage all these individual instances of hardware individually. So with that, with that little introduction, I want to spend some time today, just a very few minutes today, talking a little bit more with Max about 
how a hardwareless SAN can help in the remote office and branch office situation. And, uh, different from our last presentation, we're going to focus a little bit more on the technical underpinnings of what actually makes this kind of remote office SAN. So Max, uh, once again, it's great to talk with you. Uh, thanks for coming on the line. Hi, Greg. Hi, everybody. Nice to have you here. Thanks for coming. Uh, well, yeah, definitely. Uh, hardwareless as a word which is a synonym of virtualization error right now. With most of stuff being virtualized nowadays, storage keeps the pace and it's also getting virtualized and converged with the hypervisor. So as your applications in main and branch offices are getting virtualized, you start spotting that you have unused servers, you have more and more hardware which you don't know what to do with. And here is a problem. With a main location, this could be acceptable, but if you have a lot of locations, like it is in Robos, we're, we're talking hundreds of locations. In each location, an extra switch or a SAN which goes EOL, we're looking at really big amounts of money. So what we're trying to do is to make use of existing equipment and leverage its capabilities to a whole new level where your standard equipment you've been using for some time is now doing more tasks than it did before. But previously, it was just a SQL server for your branch office. Okay, now it's a complete hypervisor platform with integrated storage, which provides most of the applications for your remote office. And not only that, but it also replicates the data to another location, to another box in the same remote office. And should something happen, everything continues to work. And you don't need to worry that your IT staff needs to go through all the locations after a hurricane to restore the IT environment. You just know that you've configured the way it will restore itself automatically and save your stuff time and money and save it to you as well. So I know at the end of uh, that last presentation, we had a number of different questions. And in fact, uh, I, I should preface this by saying you've got a demonstration that you're going to bring uh, up here with us in just a couple of minutes where you're going to show us how all this really works, the actual show me of the storage. But before we get there, we had a couple of questions back on that last presentation where the, the talk about replication for these remote offices was perhaps a little confusing for some of the people on the line. Now, when we're talking about a storage area network, one of the things that's most important is a storage area network is so much more than just a hard disk. I mean, I can go and run over to Best Buy or to Walmart or, or anywhere and go buy myself a couple of terabyte disk for a couple of hundred dollars these days. And that is it's really a piece of storage. But a storage area network sort of suggests that there is more functionality there high availability, uh, deduplication, uh, the, the assurance that I can lose different pieces of the environment and still the, that the storage still remains up and available. These are the kinds of things that businesses these days, even in remote offices, require. So I want to kind of focus the, the, this next question in on the replication that exists inside the remote office and then also the replication that can exist, or perhaps the synchronization that can happen from the remote office back perhaps to the main office. Can you talk a little bit about how those things work in a, in a solution like what Starwind has to offer? Of course, sure. Yeah, replication from robots to main location is a very big concern as far as I know. Like a lot of our clients in UK are just bombing us with requests about remote replication because it's a regulatory requirement in UK to have your data replicated to a certain place for disaster recovery. And that is really one of the most demanded features for scenarios like this one. So what we did in Starwind, we decided not only do the synchronization between the servers inside one location, so you can have high availability where all servers doing storage in your remote office 
synchronize the data with each other, providing a redundant and fault tolerant environment. So as I said, if something happens, you know for sure that your storage survives it, and you just need to press the power button, and everything com comes back to normal. And what we also did, we added a WAN replication plugin to our existing solution. So now customers who do high availability on site can replicate that same volume to their central location without using any third-party software or without doing like backups and then copying the backups over to the primary location. Everything is done within one suite and you configure it once and then you don't really need to manage it. So you just see it working, it will send you email saying that, sir, your data has been replicated, have a good day. And that's all about your IT management. So no headache, it just works. Third question that popped in here from Joseph. Uh, he was curious about common criteria assurance levels. Can you talk any at all about uh, potential common uh, criteria assurance levels for solutions like Starwin? Hmm. Let's see. Second. Guys, I'm sorry, my, my line was breaking, breaking up a little bit. Martin, am I still, still connected, Greg? Yep, you're still here. In fact, while you're, while, you're, Lita, while you're looking for an answer to that question, I'll pose you with another one here. So we're, we're talking now about some of the technical underpinnings of creating a, a fault-tolerant SAN. And one of the ways in which you accomplish that is just by throwing multiple pieces of hardware at it. Now, I know that in the demonstration that you're about to bring to us here in a couple of minutes, you're going to show us that uh, the, the solution, for example, the Starwind solution, is something that exists as kind of an application, like an installable application that runs on top of, uh, I'm guessing, Windows Server. But when I think of a storage area network, I don't think of an application. I think of, I think of these refrigerator-sized devices that uh, have you know, perhaps operating systems built into them and you know, feature sets that are deeply buried underneath. Can you talk to me about how a, an application can perform the same types of things as what I would normally think of when I'm envisioning a, a classic SAN? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, was your SAN being not a hard piece of hardware, but being more flexible as an application is, you can use it on basically any server in your environment. And the freedom you get with this is the ability to customize it according to your needs. And Really, most of the hardware stands we see on the market do not have that much of customizability in, in there. So you have like standard set of, let's see, 40, 36, 20 drives in them. You have the firmware, you have the power supply, and mostly that's it. And the features you get from that stand are pretty much fixed. You cannot really upgrade the firmware and get lots of new features. It's not really interesting for a hardware vendor to do it. It's better to put the units at its end of life and say, okay, guys, we've got a new fancy storage box. Anyone wants to test the new storage type? Instead, if your storage is just an application, let's say you buy a server. In five years, you think that server is too old for the load of your IT environment, okay, we just change the server. It's much more cost effective. It's in both PCO and OPEX points of view. And you install the software on the newer server. And let's say you paid 30 grand for the top server today. And then in five years, you will pay the same amount of money 
for a completely new server, which will have, I don't know, 100 gigabit networking, ultra fast SSD drives, which are 10 times faster than the ones we see today. And you don't really have the headache of getting the old unit somewhere. You can just sell it on eBay or just send it back to the manufacturer. So with disposing of a standard server will get much easier than disposing of a hardware set because in five years, this will look like a mammoth. An old server will remain an old server. You may want to use it for your home lab or something like that. So you can still find use for that hardware. And on the newer server, you still have your so software storage part itself. And moreover, the software storage part also has more features at that moment. So like with Starwind, People who purchased Starwind back in 2009 are, have now upgraded to the most latest version. First, they had like basic high availability, some snapshots, and pretty, that was pretty much it. Right now, they're having VM-centric file system. They're having inline deduplication. They're having multi-layered caching, which can use RAM, SSDs, and any type of storage you feed to it. They have WAN replication, and Everything that they get just by updating their software version. So as I said, it's much more flexible. It needs a little more work from IT administrator, but the power it unveils is just much more than that. You know, let's, let's spend a minute talking though about the hardware that one might need in order to have a similar experience between a hardware type SAN and, and a software type SAN like what you're talking about here. So, so, so StarWin is essentially a piece of software that, that takes servers and connects them together and exposes their storage in, in a way that is fault tolerant and then makes it available to people in that remote site. But what are we talking about here in terms of hardware? What kind of stuff do I have to have at that remote office for a software-based solution like this to work? Okay, let's say standard three-unit servers, which can fit at least six drives or will be sufficient for most of the applications. Because small, smaller servers can be used as well, but they will not be able to accommodate big amounts of data. So I would say Basically, any server can be used depending on the storage capacity you have in the remote office. If we're talking about a RAID 10, one terabyte, the main part would be just having a server which is big enough to fit, let's say, four SATA drives and two SSD drives, and this will be everything you need one 10 gigabit card to connect two servers directly for backend storage synchronization. And basically that's it. So from my experience, it's just uh, about one and a half grand upgrade for existing server in some times to convert it to a fully functional iSCSI SAN. You know, for those of you that are following along at home, there is an Ask a Question box on your screen. Feel free to, if you have a question either for myself or for Max, drop that question in there. And uh, Max, I know you brought with you uh, a demo, uh, a pretty, pretty good demo here to talk about some of these technical underpinnings of the Starwind solution. Uh, why, don't you, uh, why don't you take control here and uh, show us the demo that you've brought? Yeah, sure, definitely. That's actually the main part of our today's event. Okay, uh, let me start the screen sharing session. Okay, yeah, that should be the resolution I'm looking for. Right, that's it. Uh, let me see if uh, the screen is now active. Yeah, you're looking good, Max. Everything is uh, clear, ready to go. Okay. Let me just full screen it and press start. Ah, 
the remote connection council ran away from me. Just one second. Okay, there it is. Now I can full screen once again. Okay, so here is our management console. This is the central part of the Starwind storage environment. And from here, we can manage entire storage in our location, or if we have multiple locations, we can also add all these Starwind servers in this setup. So it pretty much looks and feels like let's say VMware vSphere console or Hyper-V manager. So you have your items on the left and uh, you can manage everything from one single location. And let me give you a quick intro on the setup because uh, this is the part I've missed. So we have our remote connection to one of the servers here. And let me just quick pull out Yeah, I'm having some trouble with getting the taskbar here. Just a second, sorry for that. Okay, now it's much better. So uh, in our today's presentation, I have two standard servers from our test lab. These are standard boxes, which we've built from the stuff we bought in the nearest IT shop, like Best Buy. We have standard SATA drives in there. We have standard MLC cache in there, dual port gigabit network adapters, Windows 2012 R2, and Starwind Virtual Set installed. So this will be our today's test set, and I'll show you how to configure and manage a fully functional and really minimalistic environment like this one. So minimize this, and get back to the management console of Starwind. Basically, what Starwind does is taking your local storage, which you have in the servers, and then creating a mirror of this storage on each server which participates in the cluster. So currently, we have our HV1 machine and HV3 machine acting as our cluster. We have a quorum pre-configured, and we have a cluster shared volume for every cluster node according to Microsoft best practices. So this is an HA device which is synchronously replicated to its partner on the second host. And if we want to see how it looks and feels on the server part, which is go to our server, and here's our D drive. And here are basically the image files which represent Starwind storage. So on the server part, it's basically an NTFS partition with files on it. You won't be able to delete these files though, so it's completely secure. Here is our SSD drive, and the caching, so it's not the SSD drive, uh, it was, or it is, yeah, it's actually, it's actually the SSD drive. And there will be the files responsible for our layer two caching. Now our cluster is on these machines. Here is our test cluster. We've got two nodes joined to it. And we've got a test virtual machine up and running here. Our storage 
as I previously mentioned, we have a quorum drive, and we have two CSVs, one acting as primary storage for the first node, one acting as the primary storage for the second node. This way we minimize the amount of overhead associated with redirected access. To get this setup up and running, I've spent about 45 minutes, and for a new buy or a person who does not really manage SANS and Windows clusters all the time, I think it will be about one hour with our step-by-step -step how to guide. And also this process can be automated and we're working on automating everything from our console to make sure that people who create storage instantly provision it to their cluster. And if they don't have the cluster yet, they can create the storage and then just take a checkbox saying that I need a cluster on these two machines. And Starwind will automatically deploy a Hyper-V cluster for you. So the only, really the only thing you need to do is create the virtual machines and install the applications you need in your remote location. So we try to really simplify it for the users and make it possible to do really fast and easy deployments. So with this said, let me just do a quick demonstration of how easy it is to provision highly available storage from our software. We press an Add Device button. We're asked about the alias for our storage device. Let's say CSV, this will be number three. It will be 50 gigabytes, and it's all set. It appears here. Now it's a single node device, so we've provisioned storage on one node only, but we, we would like to have this storage become highly available. So what we do here, we just right click on it, on the actual device, and go to a thing called Replication Manager. And in the Replication Manager, we press Add Replica. From here, you can either select a synchronous two-way replication or a synchronous one-way replication. So the first option will give you the high availability you require on-site Otherwise, the configuration will be prone to power outages or break human factor and stuff like that. And asynchronous replication is the thing I mentioned with regulatory requirements. You have to replicate the data to the main location or to a DR site. This is the way to do it. You can have a virtual machine running Starwind in your DR location and replicate your mission-critical data to it over a WAN channel. And this is the option to do it. The heartbeat node, which is currently grayed out, is an option we're working on. It's also a virtual entity, which will be used to arbiter possible split brain situations. Let's say we, have, we just have two servers, so it's really minimalistic. Most of the storage solutions on the market right now require at least three nodes. So we decided we don't really need three nodes. We, we can have two nodes, which are rock solid, really from year 2011, when we first deployed a hyper-converged configuration. We had no split brains in a two-node cluster. But to make things reliable, because three years is actually nothing, a lot of people were using it, but things can happen. All of your synchronization channels between the nodes can go down something that can happen, human factor. That's the most unpredicted one we have in this case. So we decided to do a heartbeat node, which will arbiter if neither of the nodes sees the network. So I digress. In our case, we want high availability on site. So we use synchronous two-way replication, provide the IP address of our second host, 192.168. 092, right? And we will create a new partner device 
and change the settings for the synchronization. Here we just select which network interfaces will be used to synchronize our data, and then which interface will be used to check if the link is up and running, and if it's not, then one of the nodes will be locked to prevent data loss, and all the virtual machines will just fail over to a different node and continue working there until storage and network are fixed. And that's it. Basically, without all the talking I did, it takes under two minutes to provision a highly available device as storage for your clustered virtual machines. So now what we need to do, we just go to our cluster and in there, we launch iSCSI Initiator, run a quick refresh, and we see our new device available here. Let me just quick look. This one is the first HA. Okay, we connected, and now as soon as as the device is initialized, we'll be able to connect to the second mirror of it as well. Okay, let me quick check on the synchronization status. Yeah, so it's aligning pretty much quick. In about one minute, we'll be able to use our new storage in the cluster. And while it's synchronizing, let's go to our cluster and see how everything's set up. So these are two basic servers with no special equipment at all. So the only, let's say, proprietary software which you can find here is Solvent Virtual Sam. But as you've seen, it's a Windows application. It's completely user-friendly. It gives you all the options to manage the storage, and it does not require you to know some command line utilities and stuff like that. So after, let's say, two hours of training, you can build a full tolerant SAN on your own. And to manage it, you don't really need all the certifications available. You don't really need to learn it for months. So this is exactly the case with remote locations. You, you don't have dedicated staff to manage your IT, so it's really good to have it as simple as possible and as self-sufficient as possible. The less the configuration requires human intervention, the better. Okay, so we've got four network connections between our servers. Two of them are used for solvent, one is LAN, and one is for our live migration. We also have a test virtual machine, which we have here. Okay, this one is just installed, so it's asking a lot of questions. Let me just close this one. So basically, earlier, when an application is running on a single server, non-virtualized. If that server fails, we usually see at least 15 to 30 minutes recovery time. And then we also spend at least one hour, or if we're lucky, we spend less, to recover to the latest possible backup. In case of Starbucks, our virtual machine is distributed between two servers, and if one server fails, there is really no problem at all for the virtual machine. We can live migrate it. It will jump to the next available cluster node, and then we can shut down one of the servers for maintenance. Or if the server where we have the virtual machine fails for any reason, let me just quick try to do it. 
Okay, main thing with Windows 8 is not to turn off your own laptop in the middle of the webinar. I did this once and it was quite awkward. Yeah, so this looks like Windows 2012 R2. Restart, yeah, pretty much unplanned hardware maintenance. And restart. Here is the second node of this cluster. We have the virtual machine running on HP1 and in a few seconds, we'll see the virtual machine starting to migrate to the next available node of the cluster. So now it, you see it's that's loading. Okay, so we just saw that one of the Starwind nodes went down. So HV1 is offline and our virtual machine is still running. We, it jumped over from a failed host to a healthy host and continued to work with the clients. So it's still up and running, it's responsive. and we can do whatever we want with it. So after this environment is configured and you actually achieved high availability, it's now time to talk about the features we offer a part of high availability because just being highly available nowadays, it's not enough. Data is growing constantly, virtual machine demands are growing as fast as they can. Sometimes they are growing faster than the CPU speed. And what we have as an answer is a new VM-centric file system. So the storage we use in Starwind, on top of that standard NTFS volume you've seen in this device, it is actually not just standard NTFS storage, but uh, a storage on our own file system, which is virtual inside your existing server. And that file system is LSFS, which stands for Lock Structured File System. So the idea behind LSFS is to get the IO Blender, which comes from the virtualized environment where tons of virtual machines generate sequential and random I.O. at the same time, and everything that streams down to storage just spinning it to the ground because spinning this cannot completely sustain random load. At some point, they just degrade the performance to unusable. So we decided why not to use that random load and sequentialize it. So every random write coming to the system is first gathered into a stripe long write request and then it's written to the storage sequentially. So we do not rewrite anything. We do not move the spindle here and there to write the data. We just write everything sequentially and then we keep a separate log which is kept for reads. So basically where earlier you would see, let's say, 40 to 50 IOPS from a single drive. Starwind can give you full 200 IOPS from a single drive under random load. If we extrapolate this further up to enterprise environment, this means that customers can use their RAID 5s, RAID zeros, RAID 50s, and still have the performance of a RAID 10 or RAID 0 behind it. Combined with multiple layers of cache, which Starwind now supports, so you, you don't only have the RAM cache, you also have an SSD cache behind the servers. The performance gets 
really, really good. So while we were talking, our virtual machine worked on one server only. We were kind of not fixing the outage. So let's just go and reconnect to our first server and see how Starling restores this situation from an outage. Okay, so we, we do see a connection lost on the Starwind side. Our devices are working just fine. They show yellow exclamation marks showing that one of the nodes is not synchronized, and it may be completely down. HA image 4 didn't manage to synchronize to that moment, so this one is marked with a red exclamation mark, but we don't have any virtual machines on it now. So we're good with that. Let me quick start another cluster node. HV1. Okay, we've reconnected, and Starwind started the automatic synchronization. And we'll see that the devices we were using are now going to synchronize one by one. So during that time, our cluster is still available, and we can go to our virtual machine, and still do something on it. Let's say download the disk benchmark and quickly run some performance checks on our virtual machine. And Greg, I think while I'm doing this, uh, we can also combine this with uh, part of Q&A session because. Looking at download may not be so interesting for people, but uh, maybe answering the questions would be. Absolutely. So for those of you that are following along, uh, on your screen you should find an Ask a Question box. Uh, based on what you've seen here so far and also the conversation we've had, if you have a question for either myself or Max, feel free to drop it in on that Ask a Question box screen, and uh, we will answer them here live here on the air. Max, what you're showing us is, uh, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, what you're showing us here is uh, some pretty interesting stuff. Now, if a person is to, for example, invest in a Starwin solution, are all these features available with, uh, with your, your standard solution? Are there tiers to your solution? Can you talk to us a bit about the different options that are available? Of course. Of course. So we have multiple ways of deploying our solution. So starting with the free version, which comes for Hyper-V with certain limitations like 128 gigabytes of HA storage, and it's only available to MCPs. Then there is a much more interesting free offering, which is a two-node unlimited capacity and unlimited features virtual SAN for vSphere. So this will be a really good thing for people to deploy when they just have two servers and they are not as that big yet to have three servers and install VM vSphere, sorry, VMware vSAN. Then our commercial versions, first one is a single node license, which comes with unlimited storage capacity for one node only. And then we have storage tiered high availability editions. So we have two nodes editions going from one terabyte and up to unlimited. And then when you purchase the two node edition, you can also purchase an additional scale up node for your existing installation. Once you purchase that scale up node, you'll be then able to extend your computing storage environment on the fly. So as I showed in the 
Darwin Management Council. We have two, two devices there and we have two servers. And basically, it doesn't take much to take a device This one's not refreshed. Just a second. Basically, to take our existing cluster, add a node on the Microsoft failover cluster level, and then ask Starwind to replicate that data over to the third node. So now you don't have two nodes high availability, you have three nodes high availability. And this configuration can also scale further beyond 64 nodes. At 64 nodes, Microsoft failover cluster says that's my limit, but uh, technically Starwind can do more than that. I'm not sure if it really a robo scenario with a 64 node Hyper-B cluster. Unfortunately, I haven't seen this one in my life yet. I hope I'll see it sometime soon but technically that is possible. Got a question coming in here. Can you talk a bit more about, so if I'm replicating the content from a remote location into for, for a remote office back to a main office, can you talk a little bit about the kinds of, of the bandwidth or the kinds of throughput that I might expect in that amount of data moving from one location to the other? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, our current implementation of remote replication is optimized for WAN channels from 2 megs per second, sorry, 2, two megs and higher. And the good thing about our replication feature is that the data which is being replicated can also be deduplicated prior to the replication. So you don't need to push the whole data with the replication link. You first pack it, actually Starwind packs it for you, and then it sends it over to the off-site location. And moreover, on the off-site location, Starwind has versioning of your data. So if something happens to your data on the primary site, let's like say a virus attack or human factor, if you replicate disease data to the off-site, Starwind will still be able to recover the, your data to that state where it was actually still alive and healthy. There's another question coming in from uh, Robert, and uh, I, I think I'm getting this question correct. If not, uh, go ahead and throw it back in here, Robert. But Robert wants to know what the ultimate connection to that virtual storage looks like. So I seen uh, if we're talking about connection between these servers, uh, then it's standard 10 gigabit Ethernet. I think that's the best way to connect the virtual sands between each other right now. Robert, please feel free to ask the question once again if I have not understood it correctly. Got another question coming in here too. Uh, this person asks, so if I'm in my main office and I have these, uh, the, these various storage devices that are thrown about through my different remote offices, am I going to be able to manage the configuration of those remote office, of that remote office storage from the main office? Does the, the management tool that you use to, to, to work with all these work across remote connections? Yeah, of course. Starwind, iSCSI, and Virtual SAN have a unified management console. So the, depending on uh, what you're running, you can still install one console on your laptop in the central mainframe and use it to control the entire storage of your company.
Well, with that, it looks like we've come to the end of our questions for today's presentation. Uh, Max, I want to thank you and also to Starwin for sponsoring our talk today. You're welcome, and thank you for joining us with your expertise. Thank you uh, to all of you that are wherever you may be. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, thanks for joining us today for Show Me the Storage, a look at some of the hardware-less solutions, hardware-less storage solutions that exist out there. Uh, I'm Greg Shields, and uh, it's been a great time talking with you today. With that, I'd like to turn things back to Chris Flack for some closing thoughts. Chris? Yeah, thank you so much, Greg and Max, uh, for your presentations today and taking time out of your schedules to join everybody for an hour. Much appreciated. And, and thank you, everybody in the audience, especially those who joined us on Tuesday as well for, uh, for the first part of the webcast. We appreciate you joining. Uh, don't forget, uh, keep an eye on your inbox. You'll receive a link to the replay. Share that with coworkers and friends who may be interested as well. Uh, but thank you all for joining today's webcast, sponsored by Starwind and brought to you by Redmond Magazine. We hope you have a great day, everybody. Take care. <laughs>